All right, welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. Uh, this week we have the last talk of the year. And it is a pleasure to have uh, uh, Luca Ballotta, uh, who is a PhD student at the University of Padova, working with Professor Luca Schenato. So something about Luca. Uh, Luca received his bachelor's degree in information engineering and the master's degree in automation engineering uh, from the University of Padova. And uh, he, he then started his PhD uh, going uh, st st between staying in Padova and going to Boston, working with uh, Professor Luca Carlone and Eta Modiano at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So his research is about uh, control design for time critical network systems. And in particular, he focuses on sensor selection, resource allocation, and control and communication co-design uh, in system in which you have uh, wireless network systems. Today he's gonna talk about uh, the performance trade-offs in these systems, and we are very interested into what he's going to talk about. And uh, I leave the stage to you, uh, Luca. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joelle. And so, yeah, as I mentioned, I, I will uh, talk about these performance trade-offs that arise in uh, natural control systems or distributed systems. And uh, like before getting started, I uh, already mentioned that I will uh, like cover uh, three uh, topics which are uh, fairly different. So please, don't, if you if you have any questions or comments, uh, just mm, feel free to also step in uh, during the presentation. I really don't mind. And yeah, so that's that's it up from. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, just some quick motivations are uh, behind this, this whole uh, work. Uh, as you mentioned, we are focused on uh, natural control systems, uh, and in particular, um, time critical systems, that is where the system dynamics is uh, fast and it evolves on a, a really small time scale compared to, for example, uh, the control uh, systems, the dynamical of the system or the control systems or uh, of the sensor and actuators, for example. Uh, so um, natural control systems in general, uh, as, you, as you may know, of course, or of these uh, kind of systems where uh, there are uh, a bunch or, or a lot of devices uh, which are connected with each other. And in particular, uh, I will focus on uh, wireless um, connected systems. So uh, where the communication occurs over wireless channels, uh, which of course um, come with a lot of benefits, but also uh, uh, several issues at times. <clears throat> so the first uh, thing I wanna mention about these uh, systems are three uh, pillars, I'll call them, that are very, um, very common, let's say, commonly acknowledged, acknowledged um, characteristics, uh, um, positive characteristics, let's say, of these uh, systems. Um, and they usually try to uh, comply with as much as possible. So the first is that uh, the more sensor you have, the better uh, the overall performance. And in general, like a, a bit like uh, sensor selection or other kind of, uh, let's say, selection who usually try, uh, try to uh, trade performance with, uh, for example, a budget cost that you have. But in general, you try to uh, really have a lot of sensors. And for example, uh, if you need to select this because you have budget constraints or maybe you can't place uh, physically sensors everywhere or uh, such things. Uh, the second pillar is that you usually in these systems try to enhance and improve, increase communication where for communication here, I mean peer-to-peer um, -peer, uh, communication links in, um, in communication networks, in, in general in mesh networks, uh, because this in, in general allows you to get uh, more feedback information, for example, uh, if you want to monitor an environment or control uh, a distributed setup, you, you usually want to have as much information as possible to, uh, to do feedback. Uh, and also in smaller networks, for example, for um, load transportation, you usually will like, to, uh, will like all the devices to communicate with each other so that uh, they can perform the task optimally. 
And lastly, uh, in in some networks where you need to um, you need your your devices to perform something collaboratively or coordinately, uh, you would like them to uh, collaborate as much as possible. So uh, not only share information, but also try to use this information to adapt to a protocol which is as much collaborative as possible. Uh, think, for example, to consensor networks uh, or in general distributed utilization tasks where um, you, you, want to, you want the devices to collaborate to, for example, uh, optimize some performance metric. Uh, so now that I have brought these three uh, pillars, uh, I'm going to question all of them <laughs> throughout the talk. And so in particular, I would like to, what we would like to do here is to understand if this is actually the case that all of these, um, let's say, uh, common knowledge here is always, or if mm, there may be situations where uh, that's not really the case, but um, rather you need to really uh, understand whether there are uh, some trade-offs uh, or some other characterization of our system so that uh, any of this concept, uh, which would be intuitively true regardless, is not true anymore. <clears throat> so now to ground uh, discussion a little bit, uh, let me go through the um, topics that, uh, that I will cover in this presentation. The first is uh, distributed sensing uh, in the presence of computational latency where uh, for computational latency, I mean the um, onboard computation performed uh, carried on by um, uh, devices in the network, or also um, a master node, for example, that is managing a network. Uh, and it, it turns out here the computational latency is really key to um, to the non-obvious trade-off that arises. In. The second topic is the design of a distributed controller architecture uh, in the presence of communication latency. And here also it's the, the communication latency uh, brings you to a particular situation where uh, it is not optimal always uh, to, um, to increase communication as much as possible. And finally, I will talk about distributed optimization scenarios. Uh, any particular consensor, consensus networks uh, in the presence of malicious agents, which are non-collaborative agents, let's say that do whatever they want. And here the presence, the very presence of the, such malicious agents uh, brings you to a, um, uh, to a phase transition, let's call it, uh, where basically, even though your task is inherently uh, cooperative um, and collaborative, uh, the optimal thing is in general not to all agents collaborate with each other, which is uh, uh, which may sound a bit counterintuitive. Okay, now let uh, let me get started with the first topic. Um, I, I will um, I will ground uh, even more the this first topic to this example just to make things clear. Um, <clears throat> and I, I will refer to processing networks in particular. Uh, and by processing networks here, I basically mean a star network. Uh, where we have a station or base station um, that is acquiring information from an environment. Um, and all information is coming from these uh, nodes that are, uh, let's say, that are sensors scattered uh, across the environment that are actually collecting the information and transmitting it to, uh, to the central station via a wireless channel. So um, there are a couple of key factors here uh, that are the following. So the first constraint that I'm addressing here is um, communication latency. And that accounts for, uh, of course, non-idealities of the wireless channel. And the second one is computational latency uh, that uh, addresses instead the um, uh, limited hardware resources that usually uh, pertain to these uh, devices. So, for example, maybe you don't want to put a, a powerful GPU uh, on a small drone, but maybe you like some lightweight kind of processors. Uh, and so, usually, uh, you have some constraints that uh, come with uh, some non-negligible computational computational latency at the um, 
uh, at the <clears throat> at the device here. And I'm in particular referring to latency um, because we are assuming that the observed uh, environment is dynamical, so it evolves over time. And, uh, we also assume that the scale, the time scale of the environment is comparable with the latencies that are uh, involved in these in all this um, estimation or more in general decision making tasks that the central station needs to perform. So central station uh, acquires all this information um, about the environment and then, for example, in this case, um, it may want to estimate the position of the truck uh, in real time, uh, for example, to send back control commands to the drones so that these can uh, follow the, the truck along its path, for example. So you see that there are several, um, several uh, delays here to be accounted for, uh, latencies here, and also communication latencies for the data to be transferred through the wireless channel. And the idea here is trying to understand what each, se if, what each sensor should do uh, meaning what what uh, what uh, kind of processing you should perform, which in particular runs means uh, uh, choosing a particular delay, uh, <clears throat> a delay which describes uh, the onboard processing of the sensors. <clears throat> so this is uh, a scheme of the network. I, I will go uh, very quick through this. Uh, but the core elements I want to um, highlight uh, are uh, the first is referred to the uh, local processing at each at each node at each smart sensor, um, and, and basically we assume that these sensors uh, can acquire the information from the environment, environment, which you may simply imagine as a as a as a state of the system, and then they acquire some information. Uh, so uh, they acquire measurements and possibly uh, process them on board before transmitting to the base station, and will account for uh, uh, a latency accuracy trade off here. So basically, the idea is that the more time you allow a sensor to process the information, the more accurate this information will be in output, and so the base station will. Uh, exploit accurate, more accurate information. This is very similar as a concept to uh, any time algorithms. If you um, if you are more familiar with this taxonomy, and and so yeah, the the, in, the accuracy is uh, let's say proportional to the to the time you allow the pro, the sensor process. The second trade-off is that is the, the computation communication trade-off, so-called, uh, which basically tells you that if you allow the sensor to transmit for more time, to, uh, more time, so a longer delay also is able to compress information. And therefore, uh, if you allow the sensor to spend more time on computations, then you will benefit uh, from this to, um, to decrease the, the transportation delay in the wireless channel. Um, now, the, the formalization of the problem is basically uh, optimal estimation, um, and we want to um, assign the computational delays, uh, so the algorithms or the processing, uh, in order to optimize this, this trade-off, uh, uh, sorry, these performance metrics. Now, um, why are we addressing in particular um, these delays? <clears throat> well, because on the one hand, uh, on the, if you consider, this is uh, with common filter, but this is actually very, very general. So if you account for outdated information, um, the, um, uh, the presence of the latency accuracy trade-off, that is, uh, the more a sensor processes, the more accurate the information is, then uh, you will keep you like sensor to transmit for more time in order to decrease to, to improve the accuracy. So this is an error on the y-axis, and yeah, this is a, a um, uh, an estimation accuracy that improves over time. Then, of course, uh, if you allow uh, a long time, 
uh, for computations, then also you will need to, the base station will need to recover uh, a longer uh, open loop interval uh, because the system has evolved over time while your processing or your um, sensor were process, was processing information. And so overall, uh, there is an optimal, uh, so this, this is a very, the very simple case of a single sensor basically. Um, and this tells you that there is one optimal processing time the sensor should process for. Um, but then this, uh, this is with a single sensor. It's a very simple setup, but then it carries on to, um, to the, uh, the most interesting part actually of this first uh, topic, which is um, the number of sensors that should um, they should perform computation and transmit information to the base station. Now, the, um, um, so the, I, I've mentioned this first part because the analytical setup and also the concept, the um, concepts are very similar. Um, so in general, if you allow the, uh, uh, simply the estimation error of the overall system to decrease uh, with the amount of sensors, which is um, reasonable if the sensors, the, um, if the base station can perform, can uh, process any amount of incoming information uh, from the sensors. So, for example, here the base station is um, is is, um, is taking information from uh, six sensors. One or six sensors don't really make difference in terms of computational cost. Then you will you can simply add sensors, so add incoming information, and your performance will always increase. We will always improve because we are you are dropping the estimation error by a factor which is proportional in this case to the amount of sensors. But then, if you also account for um, a delay that is um, the central station that is increasing with the number of sensors then uh, the, the system behavior becomes very different. So in this case, we are assuming that not only, not only the estimation error is decreasing with the number of sensors that are providing information to the uh, base station, but also the base station uh, needs, to, needs to compute for longer time uh, as a function of the number of sensors that are transmitting. So for example, um, 10, 10 sensors um, transmitting information to the base station uh, come with a different computational burden than 100 of sensors, for example. And so if we account for this at the base station, then, <clears throat> then the, overall, uh, the overall performance is not maximized by the, uh, in general, maximum number of sensors. But there is uh, the, the the curve is makes something like this. So there is an optimal amount of sensors, basically that provide you the best the, the, the min cost. And if you add sensors uh, beyond this threshold, basically uh, you, you 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 can further decrease the estimation error. But then the um, uh, the the base station needs to process information for such a long time that then uh, when it comes to project um, in open loop the outdated information, uh, then your overall cost simply increases and <clears throat> is not worth it basically. Because there is this prediction error that is uh, an open loop error basically. So this is the uh, very simple setup again with the, um, uh, so this is very simple setup where we consider uh, identical sensors that are transmitting information to the base station. But then this motivates us to, um, to, the, um, to formulate the problem like this. So not only optimize the processing time at each sensor, uh, which is, a, let's say, problem per se, um, but, but also to uh, select sensors. Uh, and not because we have some budget constraints or something, but that uh, this intuition tells us that uh, really there is an optimal choice of sensors that will give you the lowest cost, the maximum performance. And if you add sensors to that subset, that then your um, 
in this case, control theoretic performance will, uh, will degrade. Uh, your cost, for example, will, uh, will get larger. So this is uh, the, the whole formulation, the complete formulation in the general setting, of course, a combinatorial problem. Um, so we treated this through greedy algorithms, which are the, based on the intuition, on analytical intuitions that are provided by the, uh, the simpler case study I showed you before. And, and these are some simulations um, uh, performed over the, uh, uh, a system that, for example, may describe uh, this one I show you at the beginning. So uh, may describe uh, uh, vehicle tracking uh, in 2D <clears throat> by uh, a number of different drones that are um, in general heterogeneous, so they have uh, different computational capacities. And what you can see here that is interesting is that um, so not only um, providing a complete characterization of the model allows you to decrease the cost. Uh, so in this case, you can decrease the cost uh, if you consider all, all the, uh, the delays that characterize models, so computational and communication delays. But also uh, you can see here that uh, so, so on the x-axis, uh, here there, there are sensor sets of different sizes, of different dimensions, uh, heterogeneous sensors. And, and here on the y-axis, there is the cost and the bars uh, account for different selections that only um, address, that, that only account for um, uh, either the full characterization or, the, or, or only partial characterization of the system I've described. So for example, uh, the, the, the green bar here is the optimization um, that we performed considering all the, um, let's say the, the delays and the different and the non uh, ideal behavior of the system. Well, instead the purple bar uh, is, a, is not a selection but is simply um, putting all sensors together and optimizing their processing. So here you can see that actually, even though I optimize, so for example, take this case with 96 sensors. If I take all six sensors and I try to optimize them, um, you get this cost here. But instead, if you perform, if you also perform a selection and and optimize the, the, the selected sensors, then you can uh, really drop the, the cost here. So improve your uh, tracking performance in this example. And not here that our uh, suboptimal, uh, our, the, the suboptimal solution that is returned by the greedy algorithm in this case um, is uh, selects five only five sensors over 96. So of course, uh, this is optimal in general. Uh, because this is a greedy algorithm, so you cannot expect this to uh, give you the optimal solution. Uh, but the really cool thing here is that you need not um, you need not all the sensors that you are that, that are available, but uh, in 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 some cases, in for example, in this case where uh, the processing latency is important compared to the uh, for example, the control task. So imagine that you, uh, <clears throat> if you need to steer the drones, for example, uh, you may want uh, really um, to, to control them at high frequency. So if the, uh, if the time scale of the control task or, or of the estimation task is comparable to the time scale of your processing, that it may be the case that um, reducing the real number of sensors bring you benefit uh, because the, um, the whole amount of sensors is simply too costly uh, to process in terms of computational burden. And so this is the, uh, this is the result for the case study, but of course this, as I mentioned, is a, uh, is a, is a real general idea, so you can even adapt it to different, to different scenarios. Um, okay, 
so this is the first the the um, uh, the that's it for the first topic I wanted to address. So um, if you have comments or questions uh, about this uh, that they want to uh, explore now, please please feel free. Otherwise, I will uh, proceed to the next topic. I will go ahead, and then of course, if you want me to go back, just 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 tell me. <clears throat> so the next topic is about uh, design of uh, architecture design of distributed and uh, distributed controllers. Um, and so the, the general idea that is at the, um, at the basis of this um, study is the following. Uh, so you know that uh, when you have a, a large scale, for example, system, um, then the, uh, you need to design a controller that is distributed uh, because in general, the, uh, the design and implementation of a centralized controller, which also means in this setup, uh, all to all communication um, is just too expensive or too complicated or too costly. Um, so there are two main uh, paradigms, let's say, in this setup. So the first is uh, designing decentralized and distributed controllers uh, that are scalable and, and enjoy a lot of nice properties. Um, and then the other, op the other end, let's say, is um, the centralized controller, which uh, is regarded as the one providing your best performance. For example, you know that in a distributed sense, um, the, um, the centralized controller that solves the uh, optimal control problem is a, uh, is a centralized controller that requires old wall communication. So for large networks, this is simply infeasible. And, and so uh, even though centralized controller is the best one in terms of performance, then there's a, a, a there's a tones of uh, works in literature that uh, tells you how to properly uh, design distributed and even decentralized controllers um, in order to, for example, achieve good performance. Uh, so now what we want to question in this case if, is if this is the case. So if um, there are in situations where uh, distributed controllers are not only um, more effective, let's say, from a practical point of view, but they also enjoy um, benefits in terms of actual system performance. So the assumption we start from in this case is that uh, the communication delays that characterize the peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication, so node-to-node -node communication, uh, increase with the whole number of links in the network. So this means that, for example, a very sparse architecture um, yields uh, low latencies, while the all to all communication, for example, uh, yields very, very large delays in communication. So in this case, what it turns out, and here I'm just giving you the intuition, then I will uh, go more into deep in, in, in detail in the next slides, is that um, uh, the actual, perf the actual uh, optimal architecture in general is not the decentralized architecture. Uh, in general, it's a distributed architecture. And in some particular scenarios may even be decentralized. <clears throat> so what's the intuition here? The intuition is that the uh, on this plot on the right, uh, you have on the y-axis again a performance matrix, and so a cost in particular. And on the x-axis, there is a quantity that, in general, it's referred to the um, the connectivity of the network. So, for example, the number of communication links uh, present in the whole network. So the idea is that you can split the cost, uh, the total cost, which is the yellow, the yellow one, into two contributions. The first is uh, the, the, the one that, with, that we call network cost, 
uh, that is decreasing with the network connectivity. And this is uh, related to the amount of uh, feedback information. Basically. So if you have a very uh, sparse networks, like in this case, uh, you have only um, nearest neighbor interaction, then this goes rather high because uh, each agent can only leverage uh, <clears throat> little information coming from the rest of the network. Uh, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, there is this other cost contribution, which is due to latency. And, and so according to our assumption, if the network has uh, very low connectivity, then um, this contribution will be, will, be, will be small. So for example, this network with uh, sparse communication uh, will also enjoy um, small latency cost because the latency is small. Uh, instead, for example, if, if you increase the connectivity of each eight, of each uh, node from one to two hops, then you will decrease the network because there is more uh, feedback information incoming. Uh, but then you will uh, increase the latency cost because each of these um, communication links uh, is characterized by higher uh, computation uh, communication latency. Um, so the, the setup, uh, the problem is formulated as um, optimal control in terms of steady state variance. Um, so minimum, minimum variance control uh, in, a <clears throat> in a consensus network. And the uh, circular formation is simply because it makes uh, the analytical study simpler, but then I will show you later that it's not an restrictive assumption at all. Uh, so this is the scenario we want to we want to design. So the state here, x is an error, uh, and we uh, so the system here is stochastic. So we want to keep this as close to zero as possible in terms of variance, and this is simply um, a static state feedback. Uh, so we will need to design the matrix K. Um, but notice that there is uh, this latency term here that enters the feedback, and which makes the problem uh, non-trivial and different from the usual, uh, usual, for example, designs of K. <clears throat> so this is a case uh, where you have only two communication or only four communication links for each agent, and uh, we assume this K to be symmetric to make uh, things uh, simpler. Um, <clears throat> so you have in this case, two gains to design for each agent. Um, now, because K is symmetric, you can the, the, the system here. I don't want to uh, explain all of this math here. It is not really important. The only thing which is interesting is that you basically uh, decouple the system into simpler subsystems, which are scalar. And basically the problem boils down to designing the eigenvalues of <clears> the <throat> because, uh, because you have, uh, you can decouple the systems, the, the system into scalar subsystems of this kind, uh, which resemble um, single integrators uh, where you can tune the gain lambda j here uh, you can use this lambda j, which is like a, simply a, an integrator gain. <clears throat> and, and so you, you can uh, rewrite here this problem, uh, the minimum variance control problem, as a, uh, as a function, as a simpler function here of the uh, system of the system eigenvalues or the matrix eigenvalues. <clears throat> and this turns out to be a convex problem uh, because of the assumption that we've made on the uh, sim of the symmetry of the field matrix, basically. Uh, and because this, um, this, uh, this function here, they represent the steady state variance of these uh, of this scalar subsystem are convex functions. Uh, as, okay, as you may uh, infer, let's say, by, by the shape of the function. So this is a convex problem. And what you, what 
we did was to solve this problem um, by changing. So in this case, uh, we fix the structure of the of the metric A, and so we also fi uh, fix the number of communication links in the network. So what we did was to solve the problem uh, by varying the number of, uh, in this case, hopes uh, that each agent was allowed to perform for feedback. Uh, so for example, this, uh, this, no, sorry, this case here would be two hopes, two communication hopes. And we, so we solved this minimum variance control problem by varying the communication hopes from one to 10. And, and so and the, on the y-axis here, you can see the, the cost. And basically in this case that the uh, delay increases linearly with the, uh, with the network links, you can, uh, you can actually see that the, um, that the cost, which is this blue one, this is the optimal cost for each, uh, for each uh, structure of the metrics K, of the metrics K as a minimum here uh, that corresponds to, for example, two hopes in this case. And if you change the rate of increase of the delay, <clears throat> so for example, uh, in this case, the delay increases more slowly uh, according to the square root of the number of links, uh, you, can, you, you can change the, um, you, you can see um, better that this uh, minimum changes. So for example, here is uh, three or four hops. Uh, it's probably four hops here. So the slower, uh, with a more slowly de uh, delay increase, you are allowed to, let's say, um, increase the network activity uh, while still decreasing the optimal cost. But then, uh, at a certain point, you need to um, you need to stop because if you further um, increase the communication links, the number of communication links, then um, your cost will increase. And so in, in, and in the prior case that the delay is constant uh, for any number of, of links in network, then uh, as this is, as it's intuitive, you can simply add links, uh, continue add, adding links, and you will uh, always improve your performance. And this is intuitive because this basically says that if you have a sparse network or a not-to-all communication network, uh, the latency will will not impact your cost, basically. Or better, um, uh, changing the number of links will not impact the cost because it, it won't impact the latency. But in general, uh, it will. And so the, um, the latency cost that we mentioned, that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, is really what drives you to, to um, transition uh, so this latency cost is this one and as you increase from sparse to dense uh, network uh, th this latency enters basically your uh, in this case your control theoretic cost and will degrade the sys performance according to the uh, to the um, uh, to the delay increase in the feedback loops and so all of this is with a very simple network, but uh, so with very simple dynamic, uh, which is continuous time, um, single integrator, but actually it turns out that even if you uh, make the model fairly complicated, for example, uh, we addressed a double integrator and discrete time that allows you to uh, embed wireless communication and also more uh, complex system dynamics, then uh, you see that the trade-off is, is basically the same. So this really doesn't change with the uh, system dynamics in this case. And also uh, you, can, <clears throat> you can integrate uh, general network uh, topologies as well. And, and for example, here, uh, the formulation is the same where basically you, uh, you change the number of communication hopes that it, each, each node is allowed to perform. So for example, uh, one communication, uh, this node will only be allowed to communicate with this node and with two communication hopes, this node can 
communicate with this hope and this uh, this this and this node and you'll see that the the, the, the core behavior the core trade-off is the same basically okay this is the end for the um, uh, second topic now uh, let me go uh, quickly through the last topic and uh, which is actually ongoing work so i will i will be uh, I, I will try to go fast on this and just give you main intuitions um, so the idea is that you want to perform a distributed optimization task uh, so this is a very general setup for distributed optimization uh, we grounded a little a little bit by considering uh, basically uh, average consensus so we want the nodes in the network to perform uh, to, to reach average consensus um, starting from buyers uh, theta which may be for example uh, initial conditions or measurements or something and the problem here is that you may have some agents that are malicious in the network uh, so that don't follow the the prescribed uh, protocol update protocol so if the malicious agents, for example, for example, uh, do nothing, so they keep their values over time. Um, the consensus, uh, the th consensus will uh, drive the network towards this behavior. So average consensus, which is here, is not reached, but instead all nodes converge to the malicious agents' uh, value, and this totally screws up the uh, the consensus task. So, um, so, uh, <clears throat> so these are just uh, mathematical details. So let me skip them. Uh, but what I, I will I would like to, to address instead is that uh, we tried to see if adding co a, a competitive, uh, let's say, behavior in the system could produce better results. So we uh, adopted a, a game theoretical formulation uh, and use the friedrich johnson dynamics which is this dynamics uh, to update the node states so x is the xi is the state of node i and if you uh, if you only look at this part this is simply consensus and so what we did here is adding uh, uh, this part uh, this part here that basically tells the node to um, to anchor itself to his uh, prior value or to the initial condition, for example. And so this is a sort of uh, trading uh, mechanism uh, by which the node trades uh, its, its prior knowledge with what the, neighbor, the neighbors say. And this is because if there are the intuition is that if there are malicious agents in the network, then you may want not to completely trust your neighbors because you don't know where the malicious is. If by chance any of your uh, neighbors is the malicious nodes, then you don't want to trust completely on it because it will uh, drive you towards, for example, a completely wrong value for your task. And so you better uh, rely partially on your neighbors and partially on your, uh, prior, uh, or your prior knowledge or your prior value. Um, and standard consensus is simply a subcase of the dynamics, by the way, so that you can actually compare uh, the the two the two these different scenarios. And what happens is that so this is um, these plots are errors, consensus errors, uh, which are measured basically by the distance of all nodes uh, with respect uh, to their average. And so you can see here that uh, if you um, if you set lambda equal to zero, which is this point, you are at consensus. So this is uh, the standard consensus protocol, which uh, gives you a very large error. Um, if you put lambda uh, equal to one, that means all agents do nothing and simply keep their values, their prior values, you still get a very large error. But instead, if you uh, if you let lambda range in the middle, uh, then you are actually good to go, meaning that you can uh, <clears throat> you can in general decrease your error and produce 
uh, a better output, a better response, which is uh, resilient towards uh, malicious agents. Because then you can drop the consensus error simply by adding some competition uh, on the, the, the agents in the network. And yeah, that's it. Let me skip this part because I'm already running out of time a little bit. Uh, this is simply to show you that uh, we compared our approach to some other resilient consensus strategies in literature that do not, that uh, some kind of variations of the uh, regular consensus that we are actually, uh, we can actually in some cases perform better. So this makes sense also compared to the literature. And then these are the take home messages that I will finally to list. So the first is that, as I showed at the beginning, um, in general, selecting all sensors may not be optimal if you need to account for uh, computational latency. Uh, <clears throat> selecting all communication links may not be optimal if you need to account for uh, varying communication latency uh, uh, related to the communication links. And finally, uh, the collaborative protocols uh, may not be optimal, even though your, um, your task is collaborative in the, in the presence of malicious agents that may um, wait you to study instead uh, competitive or partially competitive behaviors. Um, this is some ongoing and future uh, directions. Let me skip this. Uh, you'll find it on the slides if you like. Uh, but I mean, as you may imagine, there are really a bunch of uh, directions that may be inferred from this work. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, my supervisor, Professor Cuschinato, and uh, Professor Luca Teglone, Mihailo Jovanovic, and Giacomo Como, who um, where will we'll help me, let's say, uh, it's probably best to, to say that I helped them <laughs> to, study, uh, to study these scenarios. And yeah. And finally, here I listed some references. If you are interested in um, going deeper into some of the directions I, I've talked to you about. Um, so the first two papers are about the first scenario. The second word about the second scenario. Uh, as regards um, com competitive strategies for resilient consensus, uh, unfortunately, there is still nothing on, on the web. But I'm planning to put an archive preprint soon. So if you're interested, just, um, just I don't know, drop me an email or something. That's it. Uh, that's the end of my talk. I thought I uh, didn't lose you too much <laughs> during the presentation. And yeah, now time for questions if you have any. Otherwise, if you're interested, just drop me an email at this address. Thank you, Luca, for the nice talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? So I have a, I have a question. You you were showing these three, basically these three parts of the talk. Most the first two, and then the last one. I guess I will have to ask you the slides because it was a bit quick. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, since this is your PhD work, what is the final application that you see, in which you test, which you see as a test bed of all these uh, things you are developing? Okay, very good question. So. Um... <clears throat> Uh, so starting from the first one, um, uh, what we were actually trying, what we would have tried to do um, in, in MIT laboratories was to deploy uh, the, um, uh, the optimization algorithm and the, the selection algorithm to, uh, to multi-robot teams. And so for example, the, um, uh, one of the first applications that came uh, that came to us in mind was um, something like like this, like the scenario I, I showed you before. So, uh, in general, you may view this as uh, vehicle tracking or vehicle uh, following, um, more in general. And 
so you if you if you have some uh, some non negligible uh, conditional tasks for example uh, if you uh, if you want to deploy some uh, visual recognition task for example on the on board to drones or maybe also ground robots <clears throat> then it may be the case that the uh, setup here uh, may be applied meaning that here uh, the, the the computational burden that the either the nodes here or the station here if you don't have a very powerful station uh, need to perform is let's say on, on the on a similar time scale compared to the task so if you want the central station to steer the the robots uh, then it may be the case that uh, you you need count you may need to account for um, for this, uh, for, for acquisition and, and processing of all incoming information, if you have different sensors and 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 heavy, for example, data, I don't know, like uh, also uh, point clouds produced by lidar, this kind of things. And so this uh, was one of the main applications. Uh, then um, others in uh, came to mind to us, uh, but then, <clears throat> but a bit more difficult to let's say test because uh, we thought about, for example, uh, large sensor networks. Um, so all of that work was uh, was done or was uh, planned to be done in simulation because uh, I mean you you don't uh, you don't always get to have get deploy a very large scale. Uh, network, you know. Uh, so, for example, uh, a factory or a city wide network, something like that. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so that's that was the, the main idea. And and these last considerations also actually applies to the second uh, topic that I presented. So, uh, here in particular, uh, <clears throat> here in particular, the work motivated by. Uh, very uh, by large scale networks. Uh, so where you have uh, a lot of nodes and where communication uh, among the other issues really becomes an issue, uh, including communication and transportation latency. And for example, you have uh, limited bandwidth or you need to account for multi-hop communication. Uh, then it, it may be the case that if your, uh, if your network is scale, uh, or, or for example, distributed across a very large area, uh, then for example, multi-hop communication may start becoming um, non-negligible from a uh, transportation latency perspective. Uh, if you need your nodes, also think about, I don't know, uh, underwater networks, if you need your nodes to perform multi-hop communication across uh, several hundreds of meters or even meters, then it may be the case that um, delays become um, become important and comparable to, to the time scale of your of your system. Okay, thank you very much. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. uh, any other question from the audience? Yeah, maybe yeah, I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Dejan. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, about the first part, so sensor selection. And you talked about sensors, so so it's basically a drone. If which can have different types of sensors like LiDAR, camera, and different types of processing algorithms, or are you just comparing um, having the same kind of sensor types, like the same cameras, but just looking at how much of them do you need at the end? Yeah, that's the idea, exactly. Okay, okay. So, uh, I mean, that's the idea. Then you can, uh, then this, this, this trade-off here was, um, was actually thought in a very, let's say, general set. So, uh, so think about you may think about this even either from um, from the perspective that you have, as you mentioned, uh, for example, multiple sensors for each for each drone or for each robot or for each node in the network, and so for each uh, node you need to select uh, a suitable number of sensors, for example. But also you may see this in a um, in a more general setting where your sensors are, for example, the, the drones, 
or the, the nodes in the network. And then for each sensor, you can, for example, deploy uh, one algorithm and you have a bunch of algorithms to, to, to decide, uh, to, to, to choose from. For example, I don't know, different networks with different uh, uh, computational inference time, but also different um, complexities or so memory, um, memory cap capacity requirements. And which uh, then also um, uh, affects the, the um, classification, for example, accuracy. Or yeah, uh, <clears throat> this kind of um, this broader kind of trade-off where you uh, your your processing is a mean of uh, viewing different algorithms, uh, which enjoy this trade-off. Uh, between complexity, so accuracy, and um, computational time, on the other hand. Okay, and then I have also, thank you for the answer, I have also another question. Mm -hmm. um, did you also think about the sensor placement, so that you have this special requirements also, like, like the sensor performance depends also on the, on the distance, and also the latency of the communication, maybe it depends also on the position of the sensor. Some places you have more latency, some some places less, so that you can also optimize all over the placement. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So I mean that that would be that would be let's say embedded, for example, in in some features of the of the models. For example, um, if distance matter to communication, then you may uh, you may embed distance in the model for communication delay. Uh, then yeah, <clears throat> for, um, <clears throat> if you want to the this uh, an application of course you will need to uh, like adapt the model to what you are uh, at hand so to the sensors and to the the, the overall system but uh, this is more uh, in my opinion to to give you you know a sort of intuition slash idea of uh, the different elements you may need to or you may want to consider uh, to come out with a, a stable uh, design. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm, sure. Thanks for the question. Any other question? All right, I think, Luca, you left your email in case people want to reach out for, for sure. deeper, deeper points. Thank you very much again for taking the time in this last week of uh, the operational year. To give a talk. Um, good luck for the next steps, and uh, and yes, uh, very excited to see what are the next results. Thank you, thank you, Joelle. It was really proud to to be here. Great, and thank you all for participating. See you all next year. Bye bye. <laughs>